Oh, hey, we have sound. Excellent. Okay, uh, well, uh, I am not that Mark. I, I'm actually not Mark Reinhold, you probably have noticed. Uh, I'm Mark Heckler, uh, but uh, thank you for coming anyway <laughs> to this talk about springing into Kotlin, uh, or as I like to call it, how to make the magic even more magical. Uh, like I said, my name is Mark Heckler. I'm a principal technologist and spring developer advocate with Pivotal Software, Inc. Pivotal are the makers of such fine software products as Spring Boot, Spring Framework, uh, Redis, RabbitMQ, Greenplum, Gemfire, huge contributor to Apache Tomcat, and a huge contributor to the Cloud Foundry Common Code Line. Perhaps you've heard of us. Uh, we're a tiny little startup in Silicon Valley, uh, not so tiny, uh, and we just IPO'd. So the financial people are exceedingly happy. I'm still doing the same thing I did the day before, so, yeah, you know, it is what it is. But, uh, but anyway, I uh, blog, uh, admittedly not as often as I would like, uh, and we're already into, what is this, May now? Oh, goodness, okay. Well, it is still a fairly new year, full of fairly new possibilities, so I'm hopeful for more, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try to improve. Uh, but I blog semi-regularly at my personal domain, theheckler's.com, occasionally at our company site as well, uh, and I tweet very regularly, regularly, at mkheck. Is anyone here on Twitter? Couple hands, that's good. Okay, well, it is 2018. Uh, so I would encourage you to get on Twitter. That's where your favorite uh, open source framework committers spend most of their time. Uh, I actually am not joking when I say I spend more time on Twitter than I do in my house. It's, it's kind of true. Uh, it is true, actually. Uh, but that's probably the best way to reach me. If you have any questions, comments, and feedback, uh, I would appreciate it. I, we, we only have three hours today. Uh, okay, a little less than that. We only have 50 minutes today. Uh, so we've got an exceedingly short amount of time for all the stuff that I want to get into and, and cover. So if you would, hold your questions, comments, feedback to the end. Uh, if there's time at the end, I would happily take questions. If not, afterward, I'm happy to, to talk about anything at length. You probably noticed I'm kind of shy. Uh, but uh, if we somehow miss each other afterward or tomorrow or what have you, um, I live on Twitter. So please do reach out that way. Uh, but if you have questions, comments, or feedback that don't fit into 280 characters, or you just hate Twitter for some reason. Uh, I am a member of the slightly older and more established social network called email. Is anyone here on email? What's that? Email, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna be big, I'm sure it will. Uh, I have, like you, half a dozen email addresses. These are my two favorites. Uh, one is markettheheckler.com, and the other is my company one at uh, mhecklerpivotal.io. Um, the top one is the one I check, check least infrequently. So I don't live on email, but I do occasionally pop in and see if anything rolled in in the last week or two. So please do reach out to me one way or the other. Happy to talk uh, at length. I will say, for those of you observant folks out there, you've probably noticed with the last name Heckler, I'm the only Heckler allowed to be in the room at the time, okay? So, so I have a couple colleagues here. I know they came specifically just to give me a hard time. No, they didn't. But, um, but just so you know, I'm it. So. So, how to make the magic more magical. That's kind of a, a reference to some folks who say, oh, Spring Boot, it's so magical, there's too much magic, I, I'd like to see what's going on. Um, I'd like to refer them to this quote by Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So what does that tell you? Here's a newsflash, Spring Boot is not magic. Ugh. Hate to break that. It is sufficiently advanced technology. That's all it is. And there's everything in Spring Boot that, you, uh, that, that maybe you're a little uncomfortable because you don't understand what's going on under the hood. Disable it. It's fine. Now, that said, you're, you're adding back in a lot of the work that it handles for you. Uh, and, and I get into kind of some of the advantages of Spring Boot as we go, so I don't want to spoil the ending. But, um, but if any of this makes you feel uncomfortable, back up a level. Do all of it manually. Do part of it manually. That's fine. And then get your brain around how it's helping you to deliver real business value instead of writing another entity manager. So <laughs> anyway, so we're going to start in. We're going to make the magic a bit more magical. I, I, let me ask first, who here is a Spring developer? That's awesome. Okay, who here uses Spring Boot? Nice. Kotlin? Any, any Kotlin users in or out of Spring Boot? Okay, those of you who have both, uh, I'm going to cover kind of generally how to, uh, how to use them together. You may already know this, but maybe there'll be a tidbit or two you pick up. 
uh, again, I feel like we all learn from each other all the time, so this is good. Ah, so, oh, who am I? Well, I uh, am the author of, uh, uh, co-authored a couple of books. I've authored several blogs and blog posts. Uh, I've contributed content and code to yet more books. Uh, and I have a project in the pipeline. Uh, if you'd like to know what that is as it develops, please follow me on Twitter. That's where all the announcements happen first. Uh, I am a frequent conference speaker. This is my third DevOps UK, I think, at least three. Uh, is anybody a first-timer here? Wow, that's a lot of hands. That's so cool. Uh, well, I hope you come back. Uh, this is one of my absolute all-time favorite conferences. It's just, um, I don't know, there, there are some conferences that seem to, to get it better than others, and this is one of those get-it conferences. So, so welcome, and, and hope we see each other again here soon. Um, I am a developer, and as you might guess from the next bullet point, where most of my expertise has been won, uh, I was recognized as a Java champion about three years ago for contributions, ongoing contributions to the greater Java community. Uh, if you had anything to do with that, thank you very much. Appreciate the votes of confidence. Uh, and I am a seeker of a better way, as are you, or you wouldn't be here at this conference this week to learn more. Um, I also am a pursuer of efficiency and elegance. Java over the years has gotten a, I think, somewhat unfair, somewhat fair, a reputation as being verbose, right? I don't have a problem with Java's verbo verbosity, personally, because, as they say, your compiler reads your code once, you read it all the time. So if something is verbose and clear, that's fine. Now, that said, if there's a way to say the same thing in a, in a smaller amount of code and still retain all of the context, to be concise, not terse, but concise, then I think that's a good thing too. And that's what Kotlin offers us, along with some very nice goodies uh, in the bag as well. So thus the, uh, the attraction to Kotlin. Um, so before I get into the goals, I do want to say that as of Spring Framework 5, which was released last fall, one week after Java 9 rolled out, uh, there were three big stories to Spring Framework 5, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as a couple other nice things. Uh, one is, is it re-baselined at Java 8 instead of Java 6. Spring Framework 4.3, .x, and so on, uh, baselined at Java 6. I like to say that uh, we supported Java 6 even after Oracle didn't. Uh, but uh, we, to get all the capabilities that we needed and wanted for Spring Framework 5, we re-baselined at Java 8. It was well over three years old at that point. Seemed logical to do. Um, let's see. So re-baselining. Reactive, reactive programming. Who was in my workshop yesterday? The rest of you, why? Why not? Hey, hey, hey just kidding. Uh, <laughs> reactive programming gives you, uh, among several other things, how's this for summarizing a lot of stuff in one, one sentence? Wicked scalability, right? Uh, it allows you to do more with, with fewer resources and to do it better. Uh, so that was a big part with Project Reactor uh, forming the, the underlying, the underpinning capabilities within Spring Framework 5. That was a big part, one of the three stories of Spring Framework 5. The third was full first-class support for Kotlin. Why? Well, because Kotlin, uh, it, it's not like we chase shiny things, right? Uh, we are very pragmatic on what we support, and Kotlin is, it's the real deal. Uh, so with Spring Framework, with Spring Boot, we support uh, Java, Groovy, and Kotlin. But uh, Kotlin is undoubtedly going to be a strong contender in the future uh, on the JVM, off the JVM, and in many other cases. So uh, uh, I encourage you to look into it, and uh, obviously you're here, so that's good. So what are we going to talk about uh, today? What are, the, what are the goals? Well, first we'll talk about the whys. I've kind of hinted at some of those, but we'll, we'll go a little bit more in depth as we go. Uh, why switch from Java? What do we gain? Uh, and then is it really worth it? I mean, you, chances are you have a lot of expertise with Java. Does it make sense to, uh, to, to branch out and to maybe pick up another language, even though it may be complementary or similar enough? Uh, is it really worth it? Uh, if so, if we decide it is, what are some quick victories we can expect to pick up? And then once we kind of seize those, gotten that low-hanging fruit, what are some long-term gains that we, uh, we could achieve, and how do we get there from here? So, with that in mind, uh, anytime you give a talk, you always try to create something, uh, a, a, well, anytime you code in a talk, and I do, I think I only have one talk that I don't code in, because I just live in an IDE anyway, so why not, right? But anytime you give a talk with code, you have to try to figure out, in some ways, what will speak to people. And I know nothing 
that speaks to people more than coffee. I know it speaks to me more than anything else. And no, I'm not obsessed. Those of you who were in my deep dive yesterday know I talked about coffee, and tomorrow I'll talk about coffee, and anybody who will listen will hear me talk about coffee. I love to preach the gospel of coffee. I am not obsessed. I'm just a fan, okay? So, with that said, let's code. Does anyone recognize this guy? I am a history nut. I'm also a TV and movie history nut. Uh, this was, and those of you, who doesn't recognize this guy? Let me ask this. I don't want to embarrass anyone. Ah, oh, to quote another one of my favorite series, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Anyone recognize that, by the way? Yeah. Oh, good. This is my new best friend. Okay. So anyway, uh, so that was from Doctor Who, uh, the 10th Doctor, David Tennant. Uh, but this is Maurice Moss from the IT crowd. This is a British comedy series, which made it two, two series, right? Two seasons. Uh, and then they kind of had like a couple year hiatus or, you know, they stopped, they finished, but they didn't finish it well. So they said, let's come back together and make it like a two hour special. Every one of the cast signed back up to come do that. That tells you what a strong series that was. Awesome, hilarious, and a little too painful to see how we all, <laughs> what we deal with on a daily basis. So anyway, uh, let's code. So hopefully it'll go a little better than this. It's a, a live coding session, so what could possibly go wrong, right? So we're going to start here, right? Uh, this is the Spring Initializer. This is the home of Spring Boot-based microservices, your starting point for Spring Boot-based microservices on the net. You don't have to do this to create Spring Boot-based microservices. Uh, you can start from scratch. You can curl this. Uh, you can use the Spring command line in, in, uh, interface. You can go right here. Uh, I like to go here because it's such a great interface. It's so pretty. I'm not a designer, though, and somebody may disagree, but I like this. It kind of launches you out quickly. Uh, to start with, Here's kind of the, the, the starting point, right? It would be awesome if all of us had a boss who came to us and said, we have this Greenfield project, and you get to develop it from scratch. It's all your vision. It's all your idea. Just go, go wild with it. That would be wonderful. But most of the time, that simply doesn't happen, right? We are, or for better and worse, we have a lot of legacy. So we have a lot of Java code. We have a lot of Spring Boot and Spring Framework applications uh, in Java, right? So chances are, when you start dipping your toe into the Kotlin waters, you're going to be dealing with brownfield applications. That's fine. If you get an opportunity to do a greenfield application, that's wonderful too. Seize it. But we're going to assume that you're in the typical environment where you're going to be starting to work this into your existing workload, right? Um, so let's see. I need to make sure I don't run out of time. Everything is good. Tons of time. I did forget to do one thing, though. I, I apologize for this. Um, I always like to take a selfie of myself with the audience because that way I can prove to my boss I wasn't just sampling the coffee scene here in London. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but, uh, but if you don't mind, I need some visual evidence here. So everybody smile and say, open source. Okay, this side, let's try this. Everybody say, Kotlin. And let's see, the ones on the corner here, uh, let's say, spring. Awesome. Okay. So with my superb photography skills, maybe one of those turned out. That'll be good. Somebody, somebody's going to be Twitter, uh, on Twitter famous here shortly. So um, let's start. Uh, in order to kind of simulate the brownfield migration, I'm going to start with a Java application. We'll whip one up really quickly, and then we'll start migrating it. Now, I know I just said we're going to start with a Java application, but I'm actually going to start with the shell of a Kotlin app, flip it to Java, and then we'll go build the Java app and then migrate it back. Because why not, right? What's life without whimsy? Does anyone recognize that quote? Big Bang Theory? No Big Bang Theory fans here? OK, never mind. All right, so uh, the Spring Initializer gives you options. Now, if you are a Maven developer, you can create a Maven project. By the way, this doesn't generate any code other than the main application class and the main method. The rest, it, it just brings in your dependencies. I mentioned earlier Spring Boot has some advantages. Uh, there are three kind of key stories to Spring Boot as well. Uh, one is it simplifies your dependency management. So when you use one library, in almost every case, you're going to use three or four or eight or 50 supporting libraries to do what you need to do. So rather than have a massive build file, you have a short build file with Spring Boot starters. You can exclude things, sure. You can customize it to your heart's content. You can even avoid using those entirely. But it makes your life a lot simpler as a developer. It also allows you to version synchronize. So let's say if you want to choose a particular bit of capabilities, let's say JAXRS. 
you choose this and everything is version synchronized to your version of boot that you chose. So it eliminates that game of whack-a-mole, right? Uh, Spring Boot also gives you an Uber jar. Now you can deploy as a war file if you're stuck in the past, but if you're trying to develop 12-factor applications, cloud-native applications, chances are you're going to be creating that single deployable that streamlines your deployment as much as Spring Boot streamlines your development, right? So we're suggesting you use a jar that's 12-factor compliant, cloud-native embracing. Uh, so that's where we go with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, and the third is auto-config, right? Because Spring Boot, and this is the magic part, right? Spring Boot is smart enough to realize, as an example, that if you have a database driver on your class path, and if you create a, uh, or if you extend an interface defined in Spring Data, it says, hey, you're wanting to use data. Hey, you have a database driver in your class path. I bet you want to talk to that database. Does that sound like magic? It's really not. Again, it's technology. But this allows you to focus on your business value. So we're going to go with some of the opinionated choices. We're going to go with the simple version to kind of kick things off. If you are a Maven developer, you can generate a Maven project. Uh, if you're a hipster, you can generate a Gradle project. I, I even wore my hoodie. I got a little too hot, so I took it off. So I'm feeling hipsterish today, so we're going to go with Gradle. But again, your choice. Uh, I'm going to, as I mentioned, start with a Kotlin project. And this just simplifies the things, the settings that I need to add to my build.gradle or Maven Palm, should I choose to switch later. Uh, if you, again, start with a Brownfield project, I recommend you generate this and then just pull the settings over. It saves a lot of time. I'll do this and kind of skip ahead and skip around behind, and we'll get there. Uh, so let's start off. Uh, and I'm going to just change this to my domain. And then let's see, what kind of artifact? Well, let's go with a uh, coffee... Uh, coffee Kotlin service, yeah. Okay, so again, simulating our Brownfield application, what kind of apps do we typically have in production? Well, we have web apps, right? Uh, our typical Spring MVC applications uh, using Tomcat with Spring MVC. And then I'm going to use Mongo because I love Mongo. Is there anybody here from MongoDB who, who works at MongoDB? I love Mongo. It is so, so fast. It is so fast, it's like sometimes it doesn't even save your data. It's that fast. I like to call it the dev null of databases. In fact, I even have an official Mongo sticker here. You see it right there, dev null? Yeah, you too can get one of those if you're really kind and say nice things about Mongo. Uh, they, they love me. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm going to use Mongo because I don't care about my data. So we'll, we'll go with that. Uh, <laughs> This isn't being recorded or anything, is it? Oh, good. Okay, that's, that's cool. Okay, so we'll, we'll just start with that. We'll, we'll go with the, the very basics. Uh, so let's save that there. Um, okay, let's open that. Um, let's open that in our favorite IDE, NetBeans. Ha, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I am kidding about that. I, I like to pick on things I love, uh, as you'll find out. Uh, so... Um, uh, Spring Boot has great support in NetBeans, Eclipse. We even have a build of Eclipse called Spring Tool Suite, which actually has some awesome cloud deployment type of functionality. Uh, fully supported in VS Code with, with our plugins that we provide as well. Um, the only thing we don't support is Emacs. Please don't use Emacs. Have some respect for yourself. Don't use Emacs. I'm a VI guy. Uh, my colleague Josh uses Emacs. We, we argue incessantly, and I tell him every time he uses Emacs, a puppy dies. So I just share that. Please be aware. Please be kind to puppies. So anyway, OK, so let's, uh, let's start here. So uh, let's go to our main application class. Now, I, I try to throw out, and occasionally I'll take some shortcuts for time, but I try to throw out kind of the recommended practices, and I try to make you aware when I do that versus when I'm shortcutting something. Uh, this is a, a recommendation that I give you. It's not absolutely essential, but in my mind it is, because I'm a little OCD about this kind of stuff. Uh, you see how you have. Uh, parallel packaging with main and test, uh, or parallel directories. So here we have Kotlin. I'm actually going to also create another directory for my Java files that parallels my Kotlin. And then I'm going to create a package under that, which mirrors the package I have under Kotlin right here. See? So I'm going to do the same thing here and create another package. com.theheckers.coffee.kotlin service. I think this is a good practice to do. Again, not absolutely essential, but Please, please be responsible in your coding. Somebody else may have to maintain this. Uh, so let's start with this. This is our main application class. 
Uh, and I'm just going to do something a little crazy here right now, and I'm going to rename that from .kt to .java, right? So, so we'll take this, now that this is a pseudo Java file, and move it up where it belongs, find its new home, and let's rewrite this. I'm just going to uh, kind of kill this, and uh, we'll put in our, our main application class and method. Uh, so let's see, we'll do a spring boot application, nope, spring, sorry, spring, spring application dot run. Uh, so this is our coffee Kotlin service app. Oops, get a little ahead of myself. And then args. And then we need to do a little bit of cleanup up here. Uh, in Kotlin, semicolons are not required. This is the absolute worst thing that trips me up going back and forth, which ought to tell you it's pretty easy to go back and forth, actually. Uh, but I need to add in my semicolons uh, or remove them as the case may be. Now, just to make sure that we have everything working, uh, let's go ahead and run this. So we can demonstrate that, yes, indeed, this is a Java application now. Everything seems happy. OK, that's great. It doesn't do anything, but at least it's running. So I, I do want to take you on a quick tour of our build file. Uh, and actually, uh, this for some reason, it's bringing in an old version of Kotlin. I believe 61 is current. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, but uh, just a, a quick, could not find. OK, well, that's lovely. 41? Did I overshoot? That seems happier. OK, well, well, we'll roll with that. So you have some dependencies here. You have the Spring Boot Gradle pro, uh, plugin, makes sense. Uh, you also have the Kotlin Gradle plugin. Again, that also makes sense. And then you have one for Kotlin All Open, uh, which corresponds to our plugin here for Kotlin Spring. Uh, Kotlin as a language, all classes in Kotlin are closed by default, kind of the opposite of Java, right? Which are open by default. You have to actually. Uh, you, you have to actually block inheritance. You have to actually make them final. But in Kotlin, it's just the opposite, right? You, they are closed by default. You have to specifically state a class is open before you can, uh, before you can modify that class. So uh, Kotlin All Open is a plugin that says that you can annotate certain classes. Any class annotated as such, which you provide the annotations, will make those classes by default open. So you don't have to go through your entire code base and open, 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 open. Uh, Kotlin Spring plugin wraps that and takes on certain spring classes, certain annotations, I should say, uh, and, such as uh, component and service and at async and at transactional and, and a few other assorted cats and dogs. So it simplifies your life when interoperating with Java frameworks, in this case, Spring. Uh, Kotlin is very, uh, it has null safety, uh, which is awesome. It, it, in, it, protects you from, uh, from going willy-nilly about uh, inheriting from different classes and extending them and modifying them, uh, which is great, except that most Java frameworks actually embrace the other approach. So there are certain things that you have to do to make them interoperate very, very nicely. And this is one of the things that makes it a lot easier for us. We see that source compatibility is at 1.8, Java 8. Um, why would we have to put that? Because by default, Kotlin uh, goes with Java 6 compatibility, and why is that? Android, right? But we're talking server-side stuff, cloud-based stuff, so we don't care about a restriction for Java 6 for Android. So for us, that really doesn't apply. We bump it up to 8. Uh, we have a few different arguments here, free compiler args, uh, strict um, compliance with JSR 305, and I say JSR 305 style annotations because technically JSR 305 was never approved, so there's no specific set of annotations. But in that style, uh, we've gone through and annotated everything in our Spring Framework. So we have declared uh, everything null or non-nullable, non-null. And then for parameters, um, uh, member variables, return types that are nullable, we've annotated those as such as well. So we've done this with JSR 305 style of annotations, which Kotlin can recognize and IntelliJ can recognize. So it makes our life a little bit easier as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, I guess pretty much everything else is, is self-explanatory. We have Mongo, we have WebMVC, uh, Jackson for marshaling and marshaling. So that's kind of the quick tour. Uh, we have our Java application, again, not doing anything yet. So where do we start? Uh, so let's start with a domain class. Uh, I'm going to create a coffee class. This is a coffee service, after all. Uh, we're going to sometimes be saving things in Mongo. So we're going to make this a document, annotate this as a document. Uh, for my ID field, uh, we need a private string ID. And then we also want to track a type. 
So a type of coffee. And then we also will probably want some kind of a code uh, to slugify our type, make it short, referenceable a little more easily. Uh, so we're going to work with that, and that'll be a good start. Uh, so let's see, we need some constructors. Uh, by the way, anybody who was in my, uh, my deep dive yesterday saw me use Lombok. We had a good discussion about that. Some people love Lombok, some people hate it. I'm going with straight stock Java today for those of you Lombok haters. This will make you very happy. Uh, and also, I think uh, it very well, very easily simulates what a lot of you deal with every day in your normal environments, which is sad, but it's the way we live, right? Uh, so, uh, another constructor with just our type parameter. Uh, because we're going to expect Mongo to provide that ID. And we're going to derive the code, right? So that's a, that's a start. Uh, so now, let's see, we need some getters and setters. Getters and setters for everyone. You get a getter. You get a getter. Everybody gets a getter. Okay. So uh, we don't want anybody to be able to set the ID after the fact. Uh, Mongo's handling that for us. So for now, we'll just mark that as private. Uh, so let's see. Actually, in our, we need to drop down here for our set code. I'm actually going to do a little bit, because again, this is a derived value, so I'm going to cobble this a bit just for the purposes of this, uh, this demo. So this.code equals type, and I'm going to take the type, take it to lowercase, and replace any spaces that may be in our type of coffee with a dash, and that's sufficient, I think. Uh, so let's see. Um, and we want that to be private, too. We don't want people mucking about with that. Uh, so let's see. Get and set type. That's fine. Uh, oh, but when we have the constructor, we need to do a set code, pass or type. That seems happy. Okay, so that's at least a start. Uh, now let's do some equals and hash codes. Again, why not? And then finally, we will probably want to have a uh, two string, right? Piece of cake. So here we have our domain class, which is a very simple, simple domain class, and still we have lines and lines of code. Boilerplate, but still quite a bit of code. So let's go back to our uh, project, and what else do we need? Uh, well, we probably need our coffee repository. Uh, let's see, repository, which is an interface. We're going to extend a defined interface in Spring Data uh, called our CRUD repository, which will allow us to persist objects of type coffee with IDs of type string. And that provides us a basic set of capabilities just out of the box with Spring Boot's auto configuration, right? So it gives us the ability to find all records, in, or documents in this case, uh, or to delete all, or to find one by its ID, or to delete one, or to get a count. The general things that you would do for every data store, right? But what if you want to do something custom? Can you do that? Sure. Spring Data is smart enough. If you provide a method signature and some convention, if you follow certain conventions, it grocks what you want to do and provides that for you as well. Uh, so we want to be able to return a particular coffee if we do a find coffee by its type, for instance, passing its type, and that's sufficient. So what else will we need? Let's see. Uh, we'll, we'll need to provide some kind of a controller, right, for our external API. So I'll create a coffee controller. Again, I'm shortcutting things just a tad here in the interest of time. Uh, so our controller will be a REST controller. And let's see, we want to uh, provide a request mapping, a base URL of coffees, right? So for a, uh, for a, oh, well, actually, we need to inject our coffee repository so we can grab that data. Oops, let's see, repo. Come on, there we go. Okay. <coughs> for a minimal API, let's see, how do we start? Let's go with a, uh, the ability to return all of our coffees. Uh, this will return an iterable of type coffee. Again, this is Spring MVC. It's non-reactive. Uh, so let's see. Get all coffees, which again mirrors more of what you probably have a significant bunch of uh, applications in production as. And we'll return repo.findall. Okay, what else uh, for our minimum viable API? So we will want to also return a coffee by its ID, right? Find that key. There we go. Uh, which will return an optional of type coffee. So get coffee by ID. Uh, we'll leverage a path variable to provide the ID in question. String ID. Boom. Return repo dot find by ID, passing the ID. Uh, now, it would be really cool if we had some kind of search capabilities, right? So we're going to do a get mapping slash search. Coffee slash search, right? And we want to return a particular coffee. Uh, so let's see, search, f 
for coffee, which sounds like an awesome movie, doesn't it, really? Uh, so we'll, we'll use a request parameter for this. Uh, we don't want to require that uh, because maybe we want to be able to provide a house blend, uh, a coffee of the day, just kind of default. So we don't require they provide any kind of a, a parameter. Maybe they'll just say search, give me whatever. Uh, and let's see, we have a string uh, type. We'll search by type. So uh, return repo dot find coffee by type. And that's pretty good, assuming they've provided a request parameter, right? What happens if they don't? Bad things, right? So we don't want bad things to happen. This is Java. We still have NPEs, right? So we want to probably do a little bit of null checking. So if type equals null, null, typing is a thing today. OK, else we do this, right? So yeah. But what happens if it's null? Well, we probably, you know, principle of least astonishment, we want to provide something fairly consistent and expectable. So we'll return repo dot find all dot, let's grab the iterator and do a next. So we just grab the first coffee that we have on record. And that gets us every bit of functionality we need, but we just need some test data, right? Because I'm a visual person, I like to see the real data. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, just create a bean here. Uh, I'm going to not gene, bean. Uh, I'm going to create a bean that implements the command line render interface. Command line render is an, a functional interface dis defined in Spring Boot, which has a single abstract method. What can you do when you have a functional interface with a single abstract method as of Java 8? You can provide a lambda, right, for the implementation. So that's what we're going to do. I'm just going to call this method demo data. I'm going to uh, inject my coffee repository and go to town here. Here's our lambda. So this will run any time we, uh, we kick off our application. So what do we want to do? Let's create some data, right? So flux, oh, actually, I'm going back into my re reactive mode here. Uh, arrays, arrays dot as list. Let's create a list of coffees. Now, this is a data-driven presentation. So the quality of the presentation is entirely dependent on the quality of the data, right? Garbage in, garbage out. So I need some coffees. What are your favorite coffees? Oh, that's too easy. We'll, we'll go with it. I give you points. I like the way you think. But, you know, that's, uh, that's cheating a little bit. So Java coffee. Eh, we'll just go with Java. OK. Anyone else? What? <laughs> really? Man, I try not to judge. I mean, everybody has different tastes, but... <sighs> You're killing me, Smalls. OK, see, I love movie and TV references. Uh, somebody have one over here? Oh, Arabica? OK, well, that's a type of bean. We'll go with that. That's a, you have good, good taste. Let's see. Arabica. Gotcha. OK. Anyone else? <laughs> OK, does it, everybody know the story of the Kopi Luwak? It is a kind of coffee that's the most expensive coffee in the world. It is uh, processed organically. And by that I mean <laughs> you have people who go out and gather the semi-digested coffee cherries after they have passed through the digestive tract of an animal called the luwak, right? Uh, which is a monkey-like uh, creature that eats the coffee cherries and processes them. Uh, <laughs> it's very manually intensive to gather these and clean them, hopefully, and, and process it. So it's very expensive. I've never tried that, never really had the desire to, but yeah, OK. Kopi, Kopi, Luwak. More power to you. Have you tried it? More power to you, brother, if you have. Uh, yeah, you have? You like it? No. OK. <laughs> what does it taste like? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I don't, I don't want to know. OK. <laughs> yes. OK, anyone else? Yeah. No, come on. <laughs> I took instant. But I, uh, OK, that's fine. I switched to decaf after about 11 PM so I can sleep. So you know, that's fine. Uh, we'll go with decaf. I'll give you one that uh, if you ever get to the kind of the central US, uh, St. Louis, it's a small city, only about 3 million people. Uh, but it has a coffee roaster called Caldi Coffee. Uh, and they have a really kind of quirky story that goes with it. Uh, but it's quite good coffee, so we'll go with, with Caldi. Uh, so that's cool. That's, if anybody thinks of another one, shout it out. I'll go back. 
but we only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and roll with this. So we need to convert this to a stream. Uh, we'll map each of these coffee types to a new coffee object. Coffee object, passing the type. Uh, and then for each, we will take our coffee and we'll do a repo.save of our coffee. Of course, we can simplify this a bit with our method reference. Um, so let's see. Replace Lambda with method reference, so that makes that a little bit nicer. Uh, I, again, visual person, I like to see what I have in there just for verification. So I'm going to do a repo.findall.foreach and just do a system.out print line method reference again there too, just so we can see what we have. Now, that's pretty good. It'll run, but we're going to restart that over and over again, right, as we go through this, these examples. And each time we restart this, it's going to try to insert those same records. And I know we're using Mongo, so the chances are we won't have any in there anyway, but we might at some point get a duplicate. So I am just out of an abundance of caution. I'm going to start off by doing a repo.delete all just to make sure we're safe, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. What, what? Where, where, where do I? Oh, hey, thank you. I should have mentioned, I forgot, but this is actually a great point to mention. I sometimes get going so fast, I throw in typos. Uh, I'd love to say intentionally, but not, not the case. Uh, but I count on the front row to catch me before I hit build. So if, if you didn't want to do that, you shouldn't have come to the front row. Sorry. Next time, you'll know. But, but anyway, thanks for playing along. So um, let's, let's restart that and see what we get. Oh, that looks good. Okay, so here, here are our coffees. It looks like they're in there. It looks like they're persisted correctly. Uh, so let's go ahead and double check this. Maximize, let's blow this up a little bit, clear. I use HTTP instead of curl because it gives you a lot of nice formatting. Um, coffees, look at that, isn't that beautiful? Uh, it allows you also to, to eliminate the, the host name if you're using local host, so it, it shortens your life and makes it prettier. I could always use pretty, so that's good. Uh, so if I want to add a particular, pull up back a particular one by ID, let's grab the Kopi Luwak here. Yep, that works. Okay, let's do a search. Uh, let's see, type equals <sighs> Tesco instant for my friend over there. Yeah. All right, so let's go back here, and since I'm using Z shell, I need to close that. So that all works. Again, what happens if we, uh, if we just type search and we don't provide a type? That works too. It just returns a default, our house coffee, which is, thank, thanks to our friend over here, Java, just plain Java. So that's good. It all works. We have a running Java application. Now let's colonize this. Uh, so I think the best way to start is with your domain class, really, or classes as the case may be. Uh, I'm going to do this uh, manually to kind of show you what all is involved and then we'll go through and I'll show you a few shortcuts in that as well. Uh, so to start things off, what I like to do is just rename this from coffee.java to coffee.kt. Now, uh, for starters, uh, you can see that IntelliJ recognizes, recognizes this .kt file as a Kotlin source code file. This is wonderful. This is a good start. However, this isn't groovy, so it doesn't just take your Java code and run it as is. We have rules here. Uh, so I'm going to grab this, and one of my rules is we bring this down to our parallel packaging, right? And we bring it down here, and now we get busy. Uh, so I kind of walk through and show you some of the, the things that Kotlin allows you to do or changes you might make. By default, visibility in Kotlin is public, so we don't need this anymore. That cleans that up a bit. Uh, now, let's, I'm going to go down here and just start here, and we'll come back to our little code here. Um, so, let's see, in Kotlin, you can start off with your constructor. You can, Kotlin doesn't have the issue with, that Java does with various different constructors, with various different parameters, uh, parameter sets, right? Uh, so with Kotlin, most of the time you can get by with a particular primary constructor. You can define secondary constructors, but again, most of the time with the options at your disposal, you don't have to. So if you have a primary constructor, you can define it in the header of the class, just like so. Now, I will bring this up. Oops, let's see. Uh, oddities with IntelliJ. Here we go. Okay, so bring up my ID annotation. That all works the same. Uh, in Kotlin, you don't have type and then variable name. You have variable name and then type. Now, we can define each of these. Uh, if, we, if we add nothing to this, this is uh, just our, uh, our parameter, right? Uh, we can pass in parameters to our constructor, I should say. But uh, if we want to... Let me back up a little bit. Kotlin doesn't have the exact 
same concept of member variables and getters and setters that Java does. Instead, Kotlin exposes properties. And you can define read-only properties or, or write-only properties and what have you. Uh, but it's a bit different thinking. I kind of like it. Uh, so I'm going to make this a val. You could make this a var so it would be mutable. Uh, I'm going to make this a val so it can be assigned once, which is like Java's final. Uh, so I'm going to assign this or make this a val, and I'm going to assign it a type of string. Now, this is null safe. So it will only be a string. It cannot be nullable. What if we want it to be nullable? We add a question mark, right? So now this uh, parameter and this property can be nullable. Uh, I'm going to allow this to be nullable because, again, I don't want to have to pass a value because Mongo is going to take care of that for me. Uh, and I'm going to assign it, and this is another nice uh, feature of Kotlin, a default value. So I'm going to default it to null, even though I know we'll never use it. That's fine. I'm also going to bring up my type, which is a, another val. Uh, type of string, string, string. OK. Uh, and my default value for that will be, let's say, any old Joe, right? Uh, we hope we never have to use that. Wow. OK. So another very cool tidbit is that if you have a primary constructor, you don't have to do this. You can just eliminate that constructor keyword right there. So that tightens things up. Now, one thing that I particularly like is if this does it for you, if you don't need to add any particular customizations to your class, you're done. You don't even have to put your curly braces, which is pretty sweet. We have a bit more work to do, so I'll just put all that back. Kind of disheartening, isn't it? Um, so we'll come back to our code. Uh, by default, uh, we have, uh, since we have defined our, our constructor, we don't have to worry about these. I'm going to, again, come back to my code. But that takes care of our constructors. Again, we have properties, so we don't have to worry about getters and setters. So we can eliminate all of these. And I know I'm going rather quickly, but again, we'll uh, hopefully ping me if you have any questions or if I blithely skip over anything, I'm happy to, to clarify later. Now, we still have our things like our equals and our hash code and our toString. Kotlin has the concept of a data class. So if you define this as a data class, it takes care of all of those things for you as well, which is kind of sweet, as well as gives you a, a copy, command, a copy uh, method or function, I should say, that allows you to copy an object and override certain different uh, values, different properties if you wish or not. Uh, but again, you have that option. Uh, so we can get rid of these. Now, what happens if you want to override a particular method, like, for instance, your toString? You can do that. Again, uh, let's a little bit different formatting. In Kotlin, there are no methods. There are functions. And the shortcut for that is fun, because everything is fun in Kotlin, right? So this is a function. Now, uh, we're overriding this. So we do need to put override uh, function toString. Uh, and we can clean up some of this mess. Uh, you're probably used to seeing this if you do a lot of Java code. Our two strings typically look like this kind of amalgam of, of strings and values and pasted together and concatenated, and it's just horrible, right? Uh, with Kotlin, you have string templates. Uh, so we can just bring some of this together very neatly. And as such, which shortens this up quite nicely. Uh, let's see, code, and I haven't done anything with the code property yet, so we still get our horrible little red, but we'll fix that shortly. Uh, and again, no, uh, no semicolons. Uh, so that's getting there. Uh, now, another nice thing is that if you have a single uh, statement here, a single expression, I should say, then you can just do a direct assignment. So you don't need the uh, curly braces at all. Whoops, I need that one. <laughs> so that's pretty clean, right? So how do we deal with our code? Because this is a derived property in this case. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do this. Kotlin gives you a lot of options in most cases. Uh, I'm going to show you a, an orthodox one to start off with. This is not the way you would typically go about it, but it gives me a chance to show you something that I think is kind of nice. Uh, so you can use an extension function. For classes that are closed, this is kind of your go-to, right? If a class is closed, you can still extend it. Uh, so if you wanted to do a fun, and by the way, Kotlin has top-level functions. You don't need to nest them in a class, which is also kind of, kind of sweet. So if I wanted to do a string dot uh, double length, I could, I could do this. Uh, string is a closed class, but I can, I can modify this with an extension function. In this case, let's say we want to extend our coffee class, and we'll do a code equals, let's see, uh, let's just bring this here. 
Uh, so this would take the current value of our coffee object at the time. This dot type. Whoa, what happened? Okay. This dot type. And we will, let's see, we'll replace spaces with dash. And then we'll do a two lower case. And that's fine. Again, a bit unorthodox. We have the code right here. So an extension function probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but we can, uh, we can take that. Oh, and you can also do an extension property, right? Val coffee uh, code get and yeah, a little bit of cleanup there. So that also works. Now, what I would recommend, what I like, is just to go ahead and since we have access to our code, just do this here. It makes a lot more sense. Uh, so let's see. We just bring this here and we're done. Uh, no, we're almost done. Let's see. Oh, yes. Uh, Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking over here. Yeah, yeah, okay. So there. So now we have our code derived property. So that should work. The only thing we have to do at this point to make things play nicely is remember as a Java class, we had different constructors. So we had one that just took one parameter, the type parameter. So we do need to uh, return to a, a little bit of, you know, do a little tinkering for our, our intersection point here. Uh, so we'll take our type and we'll do a new coffee. Again, this is still coming from Java. Uh, so we're going to pass a null value in for our ID, because again, Mongo will assign that. Uh, and then we'll use type to supply our type. So let's go ahead and rerun that. Make sure it all works. Wow, three and a half minutes. So I'm going to uh, have to ask you to trust me that everything will work properly from HTTPy, and we'll skip ahead and we'll test it all at the end. Because it always works when you test everything at once, right? Anyway, so we've, we've changed our domain class. This actually goes a lot faster because the next thing I'm going to do is go to this nice short repository interface. And let me show you this capability if you haven't already found it in IntelliJ. See that? It works pretty well, especially for small, small bits of code like this. I mean, this is pretty clean. And we see that it's also now a Kotlin interface. So now we just drag that down here and we're effectively done there. So that's, that's kind of anticlimactic, right? Uh, so now, our controller, that's a bit more involved. Let's try that with that and see what happens. Ooh, it's telling us some code in the rest of your project may require corrections. That's, that's your Danger Will Robinson quote. So, so we'll do that, and it does some rather interesting things. It's sometimes a little inconsistently when you do this. Not horrible, it works, but it's stylistically a little clumsy, I think. Uh, so I'm going to drag this down because, of course, it doesn't work until... I'm kidding. It does work if you don't drag it down, but for me, it doesn't. So, Okay, so let's go ahead and clean this up a bit. I'm going to skip over my strangely implemented val get for my one uh, method. I don't know why it did that and then made funds out of everything else, uh, but we'll just carry on. Uh, so, again, single statement. We do a direct assignment. Uh, that's, that's good. Uh, Kotlin also has type inference. So you can see I've designated a return type here, or it has for me since I had that defined in Java. If I delete that, Kotlin infers the type. And IntelliJ dutifully shows it to us, which again shortens your code quite nicely. You, for those of you who have sharp eyes, you probably noticed the little exclamation point here. That's a platform type. That's because it's a type defined in Java that Kotlin says, I'm not sure if that can be nullable or not, so I'm going to just put this here to remind you. So just a, a nice little reminder. Uh, for my search, wow, we're tight on time. I usually like to show a couple different ways you can do this. I'm going to just uh, make this very brief. I'm going to go with uh, type inference here, kill my return. If else, in Java, are statements. So they return no values. They're expressions in Kotlin. So you can do if this, and it will return that as the, as the return. It will assign that as a value. So that's pretty sweet. Also, and this isn't unique to Kotlin, we can, uh, if we have a single statement, we can just tidy this a bit. So that neatens that up a bit. And instead of just doing a type equals null, uh, you can do a type is null or empty, which I think is a little bit nicer. It checks not only is it a null value, but maybe they just said type equals and forgot to put anything there. So that's a little tighter. Um, interestingly, the fact that we have, uh, oh, and I actually should change this because I can be a bit more idiomatic here with a simple first method or function. Um, so, technically, if it gets to here, right, Kotlin has smart casts. If you evaluate something and verify that it's not null, you don't have to keep redoing that in your code. It just says, you've already proven this isn't null, go forth. So, 
uh, in this case, and I've talked with the Kotlin engineers about this, uh, since we've defined that this is not null and is not empty, this really shouldn't be barking at us, but it is. Uh, so I'm going to insert the bang bang, which usually is a landmine. Usually you do not want to do this, but again, I have spoken with them. It's in the works for this to be verified. Please do feel free to check out this is null or empty. You'll see that by the time we get here, this is definitely not null, so it's fine. Uh, why is it doing this? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and run with this. The last thing we need to change very quickly is our main application. Oh, I didn't ever finish my, uh, my, yeah, there we go, my vowel. So I'm going to change this to a fun all coffees equals Oh, yes, not that. Let's fix that. That's better. And we'll just take our get mapping and we'll move that. What the heck? And we'll move that up here. Get mapping. OK, so that should all work. The last thing I want to do is change my main application class. Uh, again, I'm going to uh, just do the convert Java file to Kotlin in the interest of time. And we'll bring that down. And this gives us a chance to kind of look at uh, something that Kotlin does here. It creates a companion object. I understand why it does this, but it's entirely not necessary for our main method. Again, we can do top-level methods, which is kind of sweet. Uh, we'll just, uh, let's see, we'll bring that over. We'll make that a bit more Kotlin idiomatic. Uh, run application. We'll take our class instead of taking our Java class. We'll take our Kotlin class. And then for our command line runner, I'll do a very quick cleanup here. We'll run it, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, so again, we're providing our Lambda, a little different way of doing this here. Uh, so there we go. We've got our delete all. We don't have to do our arrays.as list. We have the list of in Kotlin. Again, I can use type inference. Automatically converts to stream. I can shorten up my Lambda here for my map, uh, and I can get rid of this because it has um, um, it has uh, name types, uh, but also if you're using lambdas in Kotlin and you don't specify the single parameter, it, it is it, right? So that shortens that nicely. Again, if you have a lambda, you don't have to provide your, your, uh, your parentheses around it, so that shortens that quite nicely. We'll do the same thing with our for each, and then we'll run it. I'm not sure why it keeps doing that. Uh, what have I got here? Oh, extra. Ah, that's nice. Okay, there we go. Oops. Wow, sliding in right over the line. Okay, <laughs> so we'll test this, make sure it all works. Oh, it doesn't. What do I have here? Failed to start. Oh, for some reason, I don't know why they do this. Uh, it wants me to uh, allow multiple instances, which I don't necessarily love, but... We'll restart it. <coughs> ah, and we're still off. That's close. Oh, yes, okay. So we'll just kill everything. How's that? Um, sure. So let's do that. Yeah, let's run it. Third time's a charm, right? Okay, that seems a lot happier. Let's verify everything is working. Um, coffees. Coffees works. Uh, let's grab the ID. We'll grab uh, decaf. Oh, dear. You know it's bad, man. Okay, so and let's try a search. Again, with nothing, this should work. Even if we supply a type equals... Oh, actually, Z-shell. Thank you, Z-shell. Uh, let me go ahead and, and close that in quotes. That also works for our default. And then if we want to do, uh, let's see, what do we have? Uh, Tesco instant. Uh, I can't get that on my brain now. Okay, so that all works. All right, so everything works. We've converted very rapidly, actually, and very easily from a Java application to a Kotlin application using Spring Boot. So that's pretty, pretty nice, right? In, in fairly small bite-sized chunks. So really quickly, some helpful resources. The repo for all this code and a bit more, actually, and some stuff I didn't get a chance to show, are in my GitHub repo at uh, Spring into Kotlin under MKHEC. 
Uh, some additional spring information is at Spring I.O. Tons and tons, more than you could ever want, but it's all there. And kotlinlang.org is kind of the, the clearinghouse for Kotlin documentation and information. And then kotlin.link has additional information like conferences and events with Kotlin, featuring Kotlin. Uh, so with that, thanks for coming. And please do stay in touch. <laughs>